to push the button, but Julia pushed the button today. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to Fly Time Monday. It's a very special Fly Time Monday because I have my friend Henry Cowan here today. Um, Henry is the originator of this fly, and Henry is also uh, also a, a guide. Henry guides for uh, carp and freshwater stripers and shoal bass, right, Henry? Uh, spot at Kentucky Spots. Kentucky Spots. And uh, Henry uh, just has a, a new book out on uh, fishing for freshwater stripers. You want to show him the cover? Henry? Sure. Because I can't find mine. I don't know where it went. There we go. And Henry is, uh, you know, pretty much one of the premier experts on chasing these um, freshwater stripers. Henry, Henry grew up fishing saltwater stripers up here in the Northeast, as you can tell by his accent. Now he lives in Georgia and chases the landlocked variety. Did, did Tom, did you notice the hat in there? See the G? Yeah, what's the G stand for? That's Georgia. Oh. By the way, okay. you know, I know you, you're a huge college football guy. Huge. Maybe the biggest I know. Nah, I'm kidding. But if you follow college football, you know that UGA won the national championship three weeks ago. So with that, I just want to tell you what, and for any listeners out there that are Alabama fans, who they beat, um, do you know what the University of Georgia has in common with a full moon? What? They both control the tide. Ha, 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 ha. As in the I am crimson tide. I am probably the, the least knowledgeable person on college football in the entire country. Okay, that's okay. But, we'll I, like, but I, I did understand your joke, so. Thank you. All right, should we do some fly tying or what? I think We're we should. Talk about college football these people are gonna we're gonna they're gonna leave we're gonna lose all of our audience if we talk about college football all right so we're gonna tie henry's fly and i will kind of pan it here called the what is it called i forgot cowan's mullet cowan's <laughs> mullet and it's an imitation of a mullet and mullet is a is a, a common bait fish, really common bait fish that, that fish love all up and down the coasts. And you want to talk about the, the origin of this fly? Yeah, sure. So, so you know, it's obviously tied on the, on the surf candy platform from Bob Popovics. And, you know, if, if I'm a huge fan of Bobby's, always have been. And, you know, Bobby was uh, penned that flies should be designed if there's a problem or a solves a problem. That's the reason why you design a fly to try and solve a problem. One of the problems um, when I was fishing back in the early 90s with a lot of surf candies where they were all tied four or five inches long, they all were tied with ultra hair and, and supreme hair and things like that. And the finger mullet that I had up by me at the time, I was living in Stamford, Connecticut, fishing the Long Island Sound. And we used to get these finger mullet runs in the in the month of September that the fish were maybe three inches long at the most. And long story short, Tom, is that I am a I am a, a tire that believes in simplicity, quick ties and breathability in the water. My flies that I design or that I tie have to breathe and move in the water because I feel it elicits more strikes. And so I tied this fly originally with polar fiber, but, you know, craft for a polar fiber, you can, you can really flip a coin on uh, which product to use. And when that fly hits the water, and one of the things I love about stripers is the retrieve is the most critical part of throwing a fly with striped bass. There needs to be, I won't say all the time, but most of the time, a pause in the retrieve. So it might be a it might be a, a something like strip, 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 followed by a two, three second pause, strip, strip, and change the cadence. And when that fly strips and free falls just ever so slowly, that craft fur or polar fiber is constantly breathing and wiggling on the free fall. And I'm just telling you that I have found I got more strikes from designing flies with materials that are supple and move in the water than those that are coarse and just show 
Um, you know, like a lot of the synthetics, they just, they're profile only. This gave me the profile I wanted along with breathability. So that's really, um, that's really what we came up with. And then we used the other thing was that that fly has a, uh, an outer body of, of, um, of, uh, of braid of easy body braid. And I think you have some there, right? And the mm -hmm. easy body braid, if you ever watch Bobby tie uh, his surf candies, he's a magician back in the day with epoxy and all the resins today. Um, and I would have to put that fly, I tie six or eight of them up at a time, put them in a dryer and they'd be spinning round and round, letting that epoxy cure. The easy body braid allowed me to put on something over the top and just hit it with a light coat of epoxy or today, once again, talking about the light curing resins. Um, and that was, that was the game changer for me is that my flies look beautiful after I tied them. Whereas prior to that, my flies didn't look anything like a Popovic's creation. <laughs> and um, I assume that uh, this, this fly will work for lots of uh, different kind of bait fish, not, not just a mullet, but uh, God, it's a, it's a great generic oh, yeah. bait fish looking fly. Yeah, you know, originally it was designed as a mullet, but we probably could just call it a, you know, a bait, just Cowan's bait fish would be fine. I mean, mm -hmm. it'll, yeah. it'll, you can tie it super small to be a bay anchovy. Uh, you can tie it longer to be a herring type fly. Um, silver sides, if you want to tie it on super small um, body braid, the small body braid, you can turn it into a sand eel for that matter. So, mm -hmm. it, and, you know, personally, I've caught, snook and redfish down on the in the in the southeast on the gulf and atlantic coasts of florida and then we fished them extensively up here on our freshwater lakes for stripers and bass and the likes and obviously it was designed in salt water so it really is a generic bait fish okay shall we start tying it let's do it okay by the way i have a bet today just so you know johnny king thinks when you're done tying this fly it's going to look like a crippled caddis. <laughs> well, no, because I can't tie a crippled caddis. He knows that. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to go over. I'm going to go over to my materials here. And Julia, if you want to minimize, make Henry small. There you go. That's, Perfect. that's better. Yeah, make Henry small. So I'm going to use a, a standard uh standard saltwater hook here uh size two pre-sharpened salt water just standard length you can put it on the hook of your choice could use a b10s you could use nearly any hook uh that you want depending on where you're fishing and but this is the this is the hook i'm gonna use and i'm gonna take that out of there and I am going to put the hook in the vise. And then I'm going to start my thread. And I, uh, you could tie this whole thing with either white, uh, white uh, 6-0 thread, or you could tie it with monofilament. I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start, um, I'm going to start the fly with a uh, white 6-0 and then I'm going to finish the head with monofilament because the reason I'm, reason I'm going to finish the head with monofilament is because the monofilament kind of disappears when you when you coat it with epoxy and now I'm going to take some of this uh, polar fiber in white and this stuff this stuff is kind of it's kind of nasty to work with uh, I'm not I'm not fond of it, Henry. You know, you know uh, they're now making it with a brush. And yeah. they make the polar yeah. fiber on a brush, and you can just couple couple wraps around the, the back of the fly and another couple of turns up forward. And you know, you've got it's probably a little easier. I, I must mm -hmm. tell you, I still tie mine the way you're doing it. Mm -hmm. I found uh I don't know if it's just uh my house or the piece I got, but I found that this stuff was just full of static electricity and it was fuzzing all over the place i couldn't get it to behave 
So I, uh, I washed it in uh, some hair conditioner and then rinsed it and it, it behaves a lot better. So if you have that problem with synthetics, a little hair conditioner, um, I don't, I know people also use, um, those dryer pads to get the static out of it. Anyways, you, I'm going to take, you could, sorry. you could, I'm sorry, you could, you know, substitute polar fiber with craft fur or, you know, the, if you wanted, I'm, I am a big yeah. fan of polar fiber just between you and me. I, I love polar fiber. Well, it's certainly got good action in the water. It's like marabou. So I'm going to take up, this is going to be the throat. I'm going to take a bunch and I found that to get the throat, I found that um, using the stuff that I might pull out, the stuff at the base actually works nice for the throat. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull, pull a bunch of this out and kind of line it up. Not doing a very good job of lining it up. And then I'm going to save that longer piece for my wing. Because I found that this stuff that came out, you know, it's, pretty decent amount for the throat. Is that, uh, yeah, the throat is fairly sparse, right, Henry? Yeah. I mean, you know, Tom, again, everybody has their easy way to tie it. I generally mm -hmm. throw a, a bunch of white on the bottom of the hook and then I turn mm -hmm. it back up top, throw some on the top, put then my top wing on, you know, the colored wing and I'm off to the races. I don't, you know, there's so many easy ways to tie this but yeah you can definitely layer if you prefer there's no question it'll probably come out nicer you got to remember you're talking to a guide and so guide flies we try to take the the simplest route because we got to tie up a dozen after we come in off the water you know right yeah okay so anyways i'm going to tie this on as a throat and i'm going to make it shorter than the wing i'm just going to make it go a little bit past the bend so right about oops i gotta adjust that camera that looked perfect right there that's beautiful so i'm just gonna measure that and make it you know not too long just past the bend a little bit that's perfect and then i'm gonna cut it off cut it off square and catch it there. Oh, I screwed that up. Johnny King, Johnny King, hopefully he's not watching. I already screwed it up. You don't have to worry. I told Johnny that today was a very special day and that we had changed the time to 4 p.m. Oh, good, good. This, this way he'd miss it. So anyways, there's my, uh, there's my throat. And now I'm going to flip the, the fly back up and my hook got kind of, my hook got kind of, now I got to readjust my camera. And I'm just going to kind of let, uh, bring this around so that it streams on both sides. And there's some short fibers I see that are coming out of there. That's all right. Get rid of that. That'll all so clean my, up. At, yeah, that'll yeah. all clean up at the end anyway, Tom. That's perfect. There's my there's my throat. And then I'm going to go back to that big bunch, and I'm going to add some more to it. That was just the the throat amount, and I'm going to grab some more here. If I find that you need quite a bit more of, you need to cut a big hunk of this stuff. Um, you, you do because you're going to be pulling out yeah. a lot of the base, you know, the back fibers, you, you know what I mean? Yeah. From so the I'm going to why I'm going to line this. I'm going to line this bunch up with the other bunch. And then the first thing I do is remove some of the really long fibers to kind of, because I want that to bulk up a little bit more. And, and then know, the Tom, just as a tying tip, one of the really cool things about polar fiber, which you're doing right there, 
you can stack polar fiber in your hand. Yeah. You know, yeah, the way you, you would in a stacker. And that's the really mm -hmm. cool. So you can be pulling out those longer fibers and putting them back in to place. And, and, but, you know, using a, a comb is a great idea as well. Yeah. But, I find that I need to, I need to comb that to, because there's a lot of, you can see there's a lot of short fibers in there and I can use those for another throat. So now I got my bunch here and I'll, I'll just double check to make sure that I've removed all the, the fuzz in there and back to the hook. And I'm going to make this wing pretty long. I still got, I still got too much stuff in there that I got to clean out. I'm going to give it another comb. because I would be too bulky. Okay, so I'm going to measure this polar fiber. Oh, two shank lengths at least. Yep. And I'm going to transfer that measurement to my other, my other hand. And then I'm going to cut it off. And it usually takes two cuts. This stuff... I find it you can't really cut it in one bunch. And then I am going to put this a little bit forward of that throat just so I don't build up too much bulk. And tie that down really tight. So I'll show you the length of it. So it's pretty long. Yeah, and again, Tom, you can, as you know, you can tie this two inches, four inches, five. You know, it's sure. it's yeah, whatever the bait fish is in the in the waters that you're fishing. Mm -hmm. And now, I'm going to take my gray, light gray, polar fiber, and grab a nice, generous hunk of it. My nice hair conditioned. Oh, it smells good now too, that hair conditioner in there. So pretty good amount of that. Cut it free. Tom, do folks know that you used to work for the hair club for men? Mm, they don't. We're not supposed to talk about that. And then I'm going to pull, I'm going to pull those longest fibers out of there. And I guess I could stack it if I wanted to, but that looks like too much work. Anyway, they got a pretty good, pretty good amount there, and I'm going to comb it again to get all that, get all that stuff. Out you know, of the that. nice part, Tom, about polar fiber is it gives such a, it gives such a nice taper off the back end. It does, yeah. It's a real nice bait fish type taper. So now I've got my gray bunch and I will I'm pulling some pulling some longer ones off camera here okay so now I'm going to measure that and just a tiny bit longer than the white just a little bit to give it a little taper then I'll measure that cut it Cut it square and then put that right on top of the white. Oh. Boy, should give my bobbin a little counterclockwise spin here. So it jumps back over that. There, got it all that time. And the nice, nice, thing, nice. The nice thing about this, Tom, is that we're not worried about what it's going to look like in front, like when we're tying trout flies. Right. That's the that, thing is you don't you don't want to worry about tapering the head. You just want to tie everything on top of. That's right. Top of the, everything the front else. is going to clean up when at the end all by itself. So. Yep. Yep. And then I'm going to take, I don't, I, like, I don't like a lot of flash. I'm going to put just two strands of crystal flash. 
on each side. So I'm going to grab, going to cut two long strands here of crystal flash, pearl crystal flash. Julia, do we have any questions at this point? We have, um, I, I not, no questions that really like make any not make any sense. I think just like some comments. <laughs> okay. oh, I, don't, I don't mean that rudely. Yeah. Jeez, uh, Louise. Right. I, I bet you I'm, one of one of them, Tom, is probably Flagler, who's you know coming in as a, an anonymous comment person. Probably, yeah. And by I, the way, I folded, Tom, I I just want you to know real quick while you're folding that. Yeah. I'm already picking you over Flagler for this fly. Oh, good. I'll so take. I've just I've just tied in a couple strands of crystal flesh on the side. Not quite as long as the wing. You could make it longer, you could make it shorter, but I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with that. Then I'm gonna do the same thing to the other side, and I find I it's easier if I roll the if I roll the fly in my vise. It's a little easier to see. And then I'm going to do the same thing on the other side. Going to you know, right the... about now, Tom, I'm assuming your eyes are probably saying, thank goodness he's tying a fly on a size two hook and not something on an 18. Well, we, we tie little ones too here. I just have special glasses to do that. And then I'm going to, so I've got some, and don't worry if it's if it splays all over the place because we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna straighten everything out um, when we put that head on top of it. So there it is so far. Looks beautiful. And then we're gonna put the gills on. So we're gonna take a a short, heavier hunk of red crystal flash. Yeah, maybe that much there. And I'll cut that off. I would wet it. I would wet this so it stays together. And we're going to just take the gills and maybe about that long. How's that, Henry? I can't see it. They got oh. your camera. Oh, I got the wrong camera. That's my fault. There you go. Right about there. Perfect. That's yep. That's that's outstanding. And just, I'm just gonna attach that. Just wind it so that it kind of flattens against the side. And then I'm gonna cut that off. Tom, do you keep, I'm just curious, do you keep your crystal flash packages or do you just keep your flash out? I keep it out. It's all in a big box. It's gotcha. a mess. It's a mess. <clears throat> you know, my first two wives threw me out of the house because of my crystal flash. Just so you know. No, I'm your kidding. First but... two, your first two wives. And, <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm kidding. The third one. Is yeah, third no, one third okay? one I got I got really smart. What I started doing. No, I'm kidding. I've only been married once. But one one of the things that I notice with crystal flash is it gets everywhere. Um, it does. And it, it does. Even I find the, it all over the house. And on the dog who takes it everywhere, and the dog rats you out yeah. because he wags his tail and it's it drops it everywhere. Yeah. So what, what I learned to do, Tom, is if you have a package of crystal flash that is in the package, one of the really great tips I learned years ago was you, it comes in a very rectangular package with a, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, it's in a, just in a, a plastic package with a Ziploc in the front. But if you mm -hmm. take the opposite end of the Ziploc and you cut it on an angle mm -hmm. on the very bottom, you can preen out two or three or four pieces of flash as you need it, keeping yeah. everything, you know, nice and clean in, in the tying area. You know, I've heard of that trick before, but, I, you know, I think I probably flagler, you know, but I'm not smart enough to do something like that. Then I'm going to take, I'm going to take three or four strands of peacock curl here. 
depends on how thick your your hurls are and then you can line them up uh a little bit just to make sure they they line up and then i'm gonna put those on top right straight on top three or four nice tight turns so that it lays on top so beautifully. And what's nice about the peacock, Tom, is the peacock gives you that bait fish on the on the on the back of a bait fish. They always have that dark top. Yeah. Almost all of them do. Not everyone, but most of them. Whether it's a silver side or a herring or a, a mullet or a bunker or any of them, they all have that dark top on their shoulder. And yeah. that peacock is just so perfect for that. Yep. It is. It really looks good. And then I'm just going to make a few more winds there. I'm not going to try to jump forward at all here. Because if I do, I got to jump over that big hump and it's going to be a mess. And I don't need to do that anyways. Because I'm going to whip finish now. You, you have to whip finish at this point. And I'm actually going to use three different uh, types of cement here. I'm going to use head cement at this point, the reason I'm using head cement, standard head cement or Sally Hansen's or whatever, is I'd be tempted to use super glue right here to keep all this stuff in place. But if I put super glue on there now and I slide that head on there, the super glue might not dry totally. And it might, um, stick to my stick too much to my uh sheath that i'm going to put on there so what i'm going to do is i'm going to use head cement and that that won't dry totally by the time i put the head on there but it doesn't matter and that i'm going to let that soak in nicely because those uh polar fibers are fairly fine and they could pull out. I want to make sure this thing is going to be durable. So I'm going to give it a pretty good, pretty good coat of head cement. You could use super glue here. And I, I wouldn't use UV cure epoxy here because if you don't cure it totally and then it gets covered up, it might, uh, it might not hold. I don't. I don't like using UV cure any place where um, things are going to be covered up or, or it needs to soak in, because it's a good. It's a good. It's a good over the top coating for things, but I don't think it's good for soaking in. All right, that's just my opinion. Now I'm going to take some of this uh, Easy Body braid which is a very flexible tubing. You can see it's really some people, and, and I apologize, I thought that you fold this over the body, but you don't, you just, you just place it over the body. And it'll have some curve to it. So I like to kind of uh, reverse the curve if I can by bending it back a little bit so that the piece that I use is relatively straight. And then I'm going to cut a piece that's longer than the body. Like so. And I'm going to even out both ends. And Tom, you know, to your point, um, folding it back over was something that people started doing with this material when they just wanted to build up a very short head of maybe mm -hmm. a quarter, yeah. half an inch. Mm -hmm. So they reverse tie it. They'd put it on mm -hmm. the, you know, they'd have it standing out beyond the hook, the hook eye, and then push it back over that. That's what they did. But in this case, we're using it for a whole body. And it's just, that just makes it a specifically good for toothy critters. You know, they, they just can't, yeah. they can't rip yeah. this fly to pieces. Right. This stuff is really strong, especially once you get the epoxy on it. And then I'm going to cut, 
I'm going to cut the back end at about a 45 degree or a little bit more angle so that I have this angle. And this is going to allow me to envelop uh, the back of that wing so that it doesn't foul. Uh, yet I can push this all the way to the bend of the hook. And I'll show you how that, how that works here. So by making that cut, I can shove this carefully over the whole fly, push it all the way to the bend. And now this top part, which Henry and I went over this last Friday, so Henry gave me some good pointers on this. Uh, by, by making that angle cut, this part here is going to keep this from fouling around the bend. All right, here's the tricky part. Sort of tricky. Not, it's actually not as hard as it looks. Now I'm going to take my monofilament thread. This is a uh, 6-0 uh, monofilament thread, clear monofilament. And I'm going to find the front end of that wing assembly which is right there. And you can generally see through this, you can see the hook eye in there. And I'm going to just kind of start my thread over the top of that and wind over itself maybe four or five times and then pull. And that that's the important trick to that, Tom, is the reason why you left space on the front of the hook right before the eye right just so you could grab that you don't want to tie this fly right up against the eye of the hook like you would most patterns yeah absolutely and then i find um i'm going to take a couple more really secure turns i find that using a dubbing needle or something to fray this makes it easier to trim it off Maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong, but I find that this helps. And then I'm going to, in stages, I'm going to pull that, pull that stuff up and cut it close so it's not sticking in the eye. And then I'll turn it sideways. Do the same thing. Turn it upside down. Do the same thing. Just to get that stuff out of the eye. And you can either use your scissors to clean those last few bits, or you can carefully come in with a cauterizer tool. Maybe I use the cauterizer. Where's my cauterizer? Here it is. And very carefully steadying your hand so you don't cut into the thread. Just hit any of those pieces that are sticking over the eye. Beautiful. I've I can't lean my hand on the table here. I normally would to keep it steady. <laughs> okay. So, got that head pretty much done. And then build up a head, right? Henry, you want to build, yeah. up, a, build up a decent sized head so that it kind of blends into the body. I don't know how much you, how much you build this up. Well, every, again, Tom, everybody's got their own idea of, you know, what they want their fly to look like. And yeah. I've seen people put the head on, that the braid on, so many different ways. Over the years, uh -huh. guys have come up uh -huh. to me and said, oh, I do it this way. Some guys just cut it to length, and then they just try to, to grab it right at the ends, and then the head doesn't need to be built up as much if you don't like a big head. Um, yeah. then, then you cut that thing, you know, you slide that braid off and just measure with your finger right to that, you know, the tie in point, but then you right. better be good when you're grabbing. That's the problem because if you slip, it's not going to build up the way you did it. 
Yeah. What do you think? Should I build that up a little more or should I leave it there? I mean, I think it looks fine. I mean, I think it looks great. All right. I'd re I think I'd retie the whole fly over again. You made one. I forgot to tell you to put in the, 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 uh, the, 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 the weight in the, in the body in case you wanted to go. No, I'm kidding. I think that looks perfect. You but you know, you can, you, you and I did talk. Spinner about, blade. Yeah. You, you and I did talk about this last week that guys can, um, if you're fishing deep water and you want this fly to sink, you can take, some uh, 035 lead wire and wrap it around the shank of the hook before you do anything. Mm -hmm. And that gives you a fly that's going to have a little more weight and is going to sink into the strike zone a little more quickly. Mm -hmm. So you can weight it or even put a bead up in front if you want. Yeah, um, You can do that too. You just better be using big enough braid because the braid comes in three sizes, small, medium, and large. So you're going to need to use a size that at least fit over the head of that, you know, the bead so that you can tie down. Yep. Okay. Now I'm going to take a, a little, uh, some super glue and just put it where I'm going to put the eyes. And this is really just to hold the eyes in place while you're putting the epoxy on it. Are you using epoxy, regular old two part, or are you do using? No, I'm uh, using resin? fly tire Z mint uh, okay. super glue to to uh, put the eyes on. No, no, no. I meant when you're on the, the when you're covering the head. I'm just curious. I'm jumping ahead. I'm oh yeah, curious. I'm using I'm using a uh, thin thin uh, loon UV cure. Okay. And then I'm going to take my eyes, my living, my living fish skull eyes and from our friends I, at flyman yep gonna grab one put it on the end of my dubbing needle i happen to like you know i've seen people build them up as well with just the flat prismatic uh-huh you know, yeah i i like yeah. it i like it better with the three i like it better with the epoxy eye quite frankly mm-hmm yeah, these are beautiful eyes. And then uh, that super glue might have dried. I may have to give it a little another another hit there because I gotta go get my other eye. And then we'll go get another eye. And stick it on the end of my dubbing needle. Reminds me of a joke about a wooden eye. Yeah, that's, I, that's that's for another. That's, that's for another. That's time. an old joke. That's an old joke, Henry. That's a Gary Sherman joke. Oh God! So now I got my eyes relatively, relatively centered, and now the goop, or what I'm, I'm using, uh, loon. Yep. UV cure thin. And there's a lot of there's a lot of really great products. The Loon is one. I personally, yeah. I, I've been using Solar Res. I'm a big Solar Res guy, but mm -hmm. there's so many pro there's so many different products out there that work. And I put I put a fair oops whoa I put a fair amount on the head because I want to I want to cover those eyes all the way. so that they don't come off. So I really goop it on the head. You have to be careful not to, not to uh, get it in the eye. And then you, you give it some more. See, and Tom, th this is really interesting. See what, what folks are watching you do. This is what led me to start making my, my bait fish patterns with the, easy body is because back in the day when you'd be putting those big globs of, of two-part epoxy, which is what we used back in the nineties. Yeah. Um, and then when you're watching that, you can see the head right there. So you're getting a, a bead about to drip on your, there you go. 
And so you'd have to put this in a vice, you know, in a, in a rotating machine with a yeah. motor. Oh and, yeah. What a pain that was. Oh my gosh. And, and come in a second time after it dried to fill in the gaps. But the beauty of the easy body braid is you can just, it'll soak right in there and just move it around and you'll get that perfect bait fish head without any fuss or any muss. Mm -hmm. And now I, I like to look at this and make sure that the body is straight when I give it the first hit of uh, UV. Just to make sure it's it's straight. Now it's straight. Now I can now I can just really give it a good good full dose of UV. Giving my fly a sunburn here. And another trick. Uh couple of tricks with using the UV lights. One is that make sure your batteries are fresh often. Make sure that if it's a rechargeable one, make sure you charge it up. If it's, uh, if it takes batteries as this one does, you know, change your batteries fairly might be a good idea to use rechargeable batteries. And because uh, once that, if that thing gets weak, the battery gets weak. It just doesn't, uh, yeah, it doesn't dry the same, does it? Yeah. And now no, you're right. Now you can see that this isn't going to foul because this is stiff. So it's going to be a lot less likely to foul. Show you the whole thing here. And there is a Cowan's bait fish with a little bit of a drip on the bottom. <laughs> well, it's okay. Listen, it's not like you've been tying 20 of them by now, but, you know, that's that's really good. You know, the simplicity of the fly is what it's like. A, you know, there's two kinds of flies out there. There's guide flies and then there's just works of art by a lot of people. And, you know, we're just looking for patterns that just work day in and day out that you can bang them out on the vice, you know, a half a dozen in under an hour. And that that's that's the key to guide flies, you know. Yeah. And in this case, Tom, like when you look at the nice thing about polar fiber and craft fur, it's not like bucktail where when you get done, let's just say, for instance, that you wanted you felt the belly was a little too long on the back or the you know, the the underthroat there on the back. You can mm -hmm. you can cut that if you wanted and you would not affect that fly one bit. And that's yeah. the beauty of working with synthetics is you can shape it and mold it. Um Kind of the way Julia is going to do her man. She can shape them and mold them any way she wants. <laughs> she already has. Done. <laughs> All right. So I guess we're done. How about that? I kept you on schedule. Oh, you did. We got, we got 15 minutes for questions. I, I notice once once I finish the fly, people drop off like flies. <laughs> I understand. I want you to What's know. A little I stay Ted Ted says it looks a little skinny for a mullet fly to him. Well, you know, again, there's there's two kinds of mullet out there. There's the finger mullet, and then there's you know the the stripe mullet. And as the mullet get bigger, they absolutely get a little broader. But mm -hmm. the finger mullet that we that you know that we're throwing. Um, the finger mullet that I used to get in Staten Island and the ones that we see all over uh, both coasts of Florida are like the size of, you know, about your finger, maybe a little smaller. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I've got buddies, you know, when I go down to the shops that carry Orvis flies um, and I'm just down there on vacation or whatnot, I can't tell you how many people say that that, that mullet fly catches everything that swims down there. They are just uh, one of their favorite flies. Um, and I've got a guy up here in Georgia and we don't have mullet on Georgia, obviously, but this guy only throws for freshwater stripers. That's his go-to fly. Um, you know, so, you know, everybody it's to each your own, whatever you, that's the beauty of fly tying is we get to create what we want. 
I see Joey D. Joey D is in here saying it's an awesome pattern. Works crazy good when tied in a carbon steel hook for brown trout. Yeah, you could you could just tie it on this hook too. It'll be fine for brown trout. No question. The yeah. only thing it's missing, Tom, is a spinner blade. Yeah, I think we're gonna leave that off, Henry. I think you're gonna leave that off. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Somebody said I need a light. I don't know. Ernie says I need a light. I don't know. I, I think what, that was what, when you were not tying the fly, but when you had like the materials, it was kind of dark, like when you were cutting and things like that. It was like for some reason it looked darker than normal. It wasn't as oh. good. I don't know why. I have plenty of light. But once you had like the red, yeah. I probably stopped it down too much. There's plenty of plenty of light there. I'll I'll make sure uh, in the future I'll make sure that I um that I bump that exposure up a little bit. Apologize for that. So Tom, are you gonna you gonna throw that for striper season this year in the spring? I am gonna throw it for Cape Cod stripers in May. Absolutely, I am gonna throw it for Cape Cod stripers in May. Yep, I think it'll work. I'm gonna tie some really skinny ones for sand eels too. Yeah. That for sand eels, it's a great pattern. Mm -hmm. Great I'm gonna pattern. Tie, I'm going to use the really small body braid and uh, make them like a size six. And then what you can do is you can just take, actually, are you, I don't know if you have any. I know I have. Um, you can buy the flash that one strand is a little bit thicker as opposed to like crystal flash or, or um Flashaboo, it's just a teeny bit thicker, a little bit mm. wider. Mm -hmm. You can put one strip of silver down each side and it gives that sandy a look. It's just perfect. Mm. And it's great for silver sides too. You know, really, really nice to tie in. But, uh, you know, down here we have, uh, I mean, I'm down south now for, shoot now, 25 years. So uh, you get into a school of Spanish mackerel that are toothy or jacks and they just can't. They just can't destroy the fly as much as as much as a clouser is my and I'm, I'm you know, probably my favorite fly to fish anywhere. Um, uh, you know, you, you ruin a good flower, a good clouser when when there's two toothy fish around uh, this. This will this will save you a fly and having to retie over and over. Somebody wanted me to put up the fly again, so I'm just putting it up there. And somebody reminded us uh, not to look into UV light. That that's a great, that's a really that good thing to do. Some guys are actually yeah. wearing glasses nowadays. Yeah. Yeah. You know, when they're, when Sunglasses. they're playing with the UV, I mean, mm -hmm. we've had yep. friends over the years that back in the day, what was the name of that? What was the name of that real soft, soft text? You remember soft text when Orvis sold soft text a hundred years huh? ago? Mm -hmm. Um, it was in a jar and that, I mean, that stuff will just, you got to keep it. You, you, you have to wear a mask. This was pre COVID back in the nineties. You'd have to wear a, an, an, an N95 mask when you were working with soft techs. Oh, you know, really? I didn't yeah, know that. Yeah. It was very bad stuff. You know, Be the uh, solvent in it. Yeah. Yeah. It had toluene in it. Oh God. I have a jar right here, but yeah, I you don't want to a long you, time. Yeah. It's, you don't want to open that stuff anymore. And then, Okay. There was that stuff called devil sauce that John, do you remember Captain John Haig in Long Island? Do you remember mm. Johnny used to go to the Edison show and tie with Bob Lindquist and me and all the guys? He was fantastic saltwater uh, tire and was a captain and a guide out in Long Island. And he was actually bottling this stuff called de devil sauce, which is kind of a soft text kind of product. And John passed away at a very young age, and I am almost certain it was due to the, the chemicals in that stuff. You know, he was practically bathing in it by putting jars together, you know, hand-making jars and stuff. If you're not wearing a mat, you got to be careful with some of these, these products that we think, you know, but then you get the stuff like Liquid Fusion, which is unbelievable. You know, that's, there's some great glues out there that are just non-hazardous. But the, yeah, uh, I, the, I love liquid fusion. And, you know, people people have a reaction to UV cure epoxy, too. Tim Flagler's had had uh, allergic reaction to the UV cure. 
he he has a reaction to it. Mm -hmm. So that's yep. that's see that's good to know. So that next time I'm at a show and he's coming around to criticize, I can break out my UV epoxies to make him move on, so I don't have to hear where I I missed a rap. Absolutely, yeah. You'll get rid of them if you pull out the UV. Um, Ed wants to know what's the largest size for snook that you would tie this in. You know, I would probably put it on a one knot. And I would, you know, if I was tying that for snook, um, I might even consider, believe it or not, making the whole fly white instead of gray over white, even though it is a finger mullet. Um, snook just tend to love all white flies. Um, I'd probably make it all white with the peacock on the top, or you could leave it with the gray, obviously, too. But uh, I, I would tie it in a one knot, and I would not weight it. Um, and I'd probably make it about, like I say, about three, three and a half inches long. That That's what Great. I'd be tying. Great. And Bill wants to know, can this be fished on the beaches in the Gulf of Mexico? If so, what would it catch? Well, it'll catch pretty much anything, Bill, because it's a bait fish. And, and most of the things you're going to want to catch eat bait fish. So it, I agree. You never I, know. I, I was, it's funny. So uh, we're, my wife and I go down to, uh, we're down in the uh, Destin area of, which is Destin is in between Panama city and uh, Pensacola. And we were down there over Christmas. And while I had a clouser on fishing out in front of the, on the beach in front of the condo, I had a clouser on and I am absolutely certain I could have fished that fly and I actually was catch. I caught four salvacore from the beach in the Gulf Coast in December, mm. which was just, cool. in a, you know, just waiting. So there's no question. Cool. It's just a fishy looking fly. Size for stripers, Roger, is going to depend really on, uh, you know, what size the bait fish are um, early in the early in the season when a lot of the bait fish are small, uh, you know, a six or even an eight sometimes some of those little sand deals and silver sides and then uh you know later on in the season you could tie it as big as big as you could throw for a bunker uh, so it, it's going to vary it's really going to vary I, I would tie it up at a few different sizes and and see what size bait you see when you're fishing for stripers but you know some of the guys have actually tied it now with a longer tail um, and they've made it like the ocean sand deals because, you know, come the fall, we get those sand deals. In the spring, as you know, our sand deals could be as small as an inch and as big as three inches. And once we get into the fall, those ocean sand deals can be as big as six, seven, eight inches long. So mm -hmm. you can really yeah. vary that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I have a question for you, Tom. Because yes, I haven't, great. I haven't fished the Cape in so many years, and I'm kind of look. I I have the shakes because it's been so many years since I've been to the Cape, and I miss it. Do they still get sand eels that wash up on the outer beaches like we used to back in the '80s and sometimes into the '90s? It's been at least 20, 25 years since I've been up there, yeah, and I'm just curious if they get those sand eel runs. Plenty of sand eels. Yeah. One of the problems with the outer beaches now is they're full of seals and you don't yeah. see as many stripers on the outer beaches. Uh, the, the seals seem to have pushed them out. Um, but, uh, you know, some of the more protected areas where the, like some of the flats and things where the seals don't go. There's, I mean, last year I saw giant schools of sand eels on Cape Cod Bay. Lots That's great. Of, lots and lots of them. Yep. Yeah. Some of my favorite. Yeah, this would be a great fill up. Uh, Phil, this would be a great uh, fly for false albacore with a little tan, little tan in it for a bay anchovy. Yep. Chris said he tied it with a deeper body and oversized braided tube, and it's like fishing a mural lure. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, why not? I think it's great. That's great. And the other thing that the folks out there should know is that the body braid comes in several different kinds of colors. So if you were fishing at night, you can buy that pearl body braid in all black and make an entire black fly to fish at night where you'll get a better silhouette on like a new moon. You know, the old adage of bright night, bright fly, dark night, dark fly. So uh, you can tie that fly up using black body braid with black 
uh, polar fiber or black um, um, fur, you know, the, uh, the craft fur and tie the whole thing in black with a black tubing over it. And it's a great nighttime fly if you're going to get out on like dogfish bar or up in, in the vineyard or somewhere. I imagine these, this tube will take a uh, waterproof marker too before you put the epoxy on top. You could probably uh, color it with a waterproof marker. Yeah, I imagine you probably could. The, the, the only thing is because it's it's got that woven oh, material yeah. in there, you're, you're going to be indenting a lot. It's going to be a little tough. But, yeah. you know, one thing we should mention, which I, I failed to mention, Tom, is that when you take that braid and you give it one good coat of that, of whether it's epoxy or the, or the uh, UV light, when you give it one cure like you did, you can still see the woven body that gives it sort of a scale effect. If you give it a second coat, once it dries, it dries perfectly crystal clear that that webbing disappears. The woven webbing completely disappears on a second coating. So that's just, again, whatever floats your boat. Hey, Ed wants to know what size you'd use for Albies in Florida for this. You know, if I was fishing Albies in Florida, I'd be probably fishing it on a size one. Um, I'd put it on a one, a size one hook and I'd be tying it again about three inches long, um, three, three and a half inches max. You don't need to go any bigger than that um, for Albies in Florida. No question. All right. Well, Henry, I want to thank you for taking the time to uh, show us your pattern and for talking me through it. Uh, last week and, and today, Henry and I had a little practice session. <laughs> my partner just stepped up. <laughs> my, my buddy just stepped up to tell me it's time for dinner for her. So Your attack dog? My attack. This is my bird dog. It's the only poodle yeah. that'll chase pheasants. <laughs> I'm sure there's more than one that'll chase pheasants. Well, thanks All for right, having everyone. me, Tom. Yeah. Well, all right. All right, everyone. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for coming today. Um, it was, it was great fun. And, um, I see that we had people from all over the world today from, uh, from what was it Kashmir or, or somebody in Iraq and, uh, you know, there were quite an international audience. So appreciate, uh, appreciate y'all coming in today and next week. What am I tying next week, Julia? I you forgot. haven't told me yet. No, yes, I have. A crippled no, caddis. I don't think so. Wait a minute. I'll tell you what I'm going to tie next week. <laughs> I haven't yeah, gotten I... the February flies yet. I don't no, think. No, I sent it to you. I sent it to you. But I'll... Uh... Oh, Schultz's single single fly cray. Ooh, a crayfish It's pattern. a crayfish pattern. That's a, We're talking uh, smallmouth. Yeah, smallmouth and trout. Yep, yep. It's a it's a crayfish crayfish streamer pattern. So, uh, and then the following week, it's going to be a Wednesday tie off uh, with Tim Flagler because he couldn't make because of his travel schedule. And we're going to be tying, we're going to be tying the CDC and elk, which is a which is a cool pattern. And the following Monday. Going to be tying uh, Duracell uh, jig nymph. So, anyway, uh, look for those. I and, take it back. Um, you did send them to me. Sorry. <laughs> I know I did. <laughs> you never read my emails, Julia. <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you everyone for tuning in, and uh, we'll see you next week. And thank you, Henry. Thanks, Tom. Good seeing you.